for your viewers who are going to hate half the stuff I'm going to say. Cooperative compensation is dead. It's a stupid practice now because what you need to be doing is just saying, look. And then in the event that the seller just fat out won't pay a commission, I mean, I know what I would do. There's only three situations where you should offer a concession in advance of an offer. We have to educate the seller that it's not about whether you're paying compensation or not. It's about- See, the problem before was that agents weren't educating clients. We didn't fix that issue. I've seen so many damn agents out there going, well, I'm not gonna show your house unless it's like, okay, first of all, if, if the buyer is willing to pay the buyer agent and they're offering two or 3% or whatever, they're like, free money. 46% of those surveyed think agents spend less than 15 hours helping them buy a house. We need to get way better at articulating value. Ladies and gentlemen, make some noise for Ricky Caru! Ricky Caru from Gulf Shores, Alabama. I introduce you, he's number one, not top four. He's the man of the real estate industry. What's everybody, welcome back. I got Mr. James Dwiggins, the CEO of Nextome here. And uh, man, you've been you have been on top of I would say you're probably probably the number one guy when it comes to like calling out what was going to come of all this, um, et cetera, um, wherever you got your inside information from. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I wanted to bring you back because um, here we are 45 days as of today after the rules came into effect um, and, and a lot. A lot has now, you know, before it was like everybody was assuming and um, trying to figure out what might happen. Well, yeah. now we're kind of there. We're 45 days in yeah. and maybe it looks a lot different in a year from now. But um, just kind of bring us up to speed on kind of what what you're seeing since the rules came into effect. Yeah. Well, where do we begin? Uh, first of all, uh, for your viewers who are going to hate half the stuff I'm going to say, um, I would ask that you guys <laughs> chew on it a little bit because before you get an emotional reaction to it, what I'm going to talk about is incredibly logical. Um, I think we'll start with, um, well, I think we'll start with the, let's, why don't we go through some of the issues that are happening first that are going to bear their ugly heads very quickly here. Um, and then we can kind of dissect that down. So, you know, certainly we are seeing two camps uh, that have emerged, um, and I'll start with cooperative compensation. Um, there's a lot of brokerages that are no longer doing it or allowing it, which are actually making the right call. Um, and then there's a group of brokerages that are still allowing the practice. It's my first comment is going to irritate people. Um, and the thing that everybody has to understand is cooperative, cooperative compensation is dead. It's gone. Done. The end. Um, and you need to understand the context as to why. So one of the things that people that know, I was a named defendant and I just recently settled my case with the lawyers, gave me. Um, I had our lawyers do an assessment on the industry as it is today and then our company as it is today and how would they sue us again? Mm. So I wanted to get everything. I want to know how the lawyers think so that we're preparing ourselves for the future. So let me walk you down why cooperative compensation is a super bad idea and how you're going to get yourself sued if you continue to do it. Everybody needs to remember post August 17th, you're now required to sign a buyer rep agreement with that buyer before you show properties. Mm. In previous to August 17th, cooperative compensation was the standard. With this new buyer rep agreement, the buyer and the agent are sitting down talking about services, terms, and their fees. And what everybody needs to understand is those fees that are being charged by the agent are varying significantly. Mm -hmm. We won't talk numbers, but they can be lower or they can be higher because you're having to articulate value to that buyer in advance of showing a home. Buyers are shopping agents now more than they ever have. They're looking at what you charge and you're seeing some of these fees come down. If you are offering cooperative compensation, you are screwing your seller. I want that to sink in because you do not know what the buyer agent and that buyer agreed to in their buyer rep agreement. And so if you are advertising, both collecting and remitting and advertising a comp rate that is higher than what the buyer agent and that buyer agreed to, you are leaving money on the table for your seller. Mm -hmm. You follow me, Ricky? Yeah, well, th this is that I, I had did a whole session on this before the rules came into effect, right? There's no need it's, in really offering it because you don't know what they've signed 100%. for. 100%. Offer something, offer something small, much smaller than you think that they'll 
put in the contract or, you know, you got, I, because at that point it's a fiduciary duty to your seller. Correct. Right. And correct. so, you, so you, here's you know. the suit. You ready? Here's the next class action litigation. Sellers feel they were harmed by the practice because agents told them I do cooperative compensation and this is the rate we should do and pay the buyer's agent. The seller goes, oh, I didn't realize I didn't need to do that. And they go, let's go, let's go subpoena all the buyer rep agreements. So here's your new class. Sellers are going to sue brokerages and agents who are doing cooperative compensation. They're going to subpoena the buyer rep agreement on the other side, which will show the exact amount of money that the agent was going to be paid versus the amount of money the listing agent said that they should offer. The difference becomes your damages. You have a new class. Everybody gets sued. Everybody settles and everyone's broke again. Mm -hmm. Further, it's a stupid practice now because what you need to be doing is just saying, look, my seller is willing to entertain any and all requests. Just put it in your offer. We call it pedo. Put it in your offer. Just so literally state, we're open to anything that you need to put a deal together. We're just not going to share with you what my seller is willing to do because my fiduciary is to my seller. Just put your requests in the mm -hmm. offer. Mm -hmm. Sure. Do you think that, see, right now we still got a lot of people doing it. A lot of uh, it's like over half the industry, right? Yeah. So, yeah. It's actually like 70%. so right now, mm -hmm. with you, are you saying seventy percent? It's about seventy five percent of the industry is still doing cooperative compensation. So, so when you have seventy five percent of listings, what you're saying are still mm -hmm. offering it up front mm -hmm. before they get offers. Do you feel like the buyer agents and the buyers themselves? are steering towards those listings where they know that the buyer steering is occurring everywhere and it's an right, absolute right. horrible so this, practice so then yeah. how do you because there because then there's a gap now between the fiduciary duty of not charging yeah. the seller too much on the buyer side but then also ensuring that we don't steer buyers away because we're not offering anything the the answer is really quite simple so i'm going to go back to my comment Cooperative compensation's dead. For every agent doing it, you will change because here's why. I'm going to give you an example. Let's pretend Ricky is doing cooperative compensation. We won't use specific numbers, but he's charging his fee as well as a fee to share with the buyer agent. And he's he and I are competing for a listing. Ready? So he goes in and says, I charge X, which is his fee plus the buyer agent fee. I go into the same listing appointment. I go, we don't do that because it's a nationally not a good practice. You can potentially leave money on the table. I'm going to charge you my fee only, which by the way, let's hypothetically say it was half of Ricky's. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have the buyer request what they need in the offer. We'll look at all the offers and we'll decide how to respond. You telling me you think a seller is going to pay double the listing fee? No, no. no. I, this, you know, my, this is another big point of mine yeah. that you're going to get more listings if you abide by the new oh. rules. We're taking listing inventory everywhere right now because every agent that competes with a next home agent, and by the way, same thing with EXP and Real and others, they don't do cooperative compensation. Every listing appointment an agent's going up against an agent who's not doing it will lose 100% of the time because the seller goes, I'm not going to pay double. That makes no logical sense. So two factors are going to move this away. And you're seeing this, by the way. So I'm, I'm out there talking to, I'm friends with most of the large brokers. They're all going, we got to move away from this practice because it's going to hurt our inventory. We're not competitive. And so it is going to completely go away as a practice because it doesn't help the seller. It doesn't actually help you gain market share. You're uncompetitive. And so eventually it will move to this process of, I believe there is only three situations that I can think of. This is just my view where you should offer a concession in advance of an offer. Probate, divorce, buyer's market, where you want to incentivize the buyer Mm -hmm. to write an offer on this house because there's there's extra incentives. Beyond those three scenarios, I think everything should be this. Just put whatever the hell you need in the offer to help the buyer. You and the buyer are going to have this conversation. Are you, are you able to pay my fee? No. So mm -hmm. we're in agreement that my fee is going to go into the offer on every on every offer we write. Yes. That's, that's it. And when people call and ask, they're like, hey, what are you offering for cooperative compensation? You can ask the question. I'm not denying the fact that it's something that you you shouldn't do necessarily, but it's irrelevant because even if the, the seller's agent says we're not offering anything, you just go to your buyer and go, they're not offering anything in advance, but what we're going to do is just put everything we need in the offer to make a deal come together and we'll negotiate from there. That's the part that every agent needs to get like dialed into their brain. You oh, cannot steer people. Died. Yeah. You cannot steer people. You cannot say what they're not offering steering themselves though. Buyers are steering themselves because agents aren't educating them correctly. Mm -hmm. That's the only reason is because the buyer's agent isn't, isn't telling them 
it doesn't matter whether the seller is offering compensation or not. What we will do is put everything in the offer and request it just like you do in any other negotiation. This is an industry problem and an education problem. Mm -hmm. Agents need to do their damn job. You have a fiduciary to your buyer. Tell them this. Every property that's for sale, we will show it. I will tell you if they're offering compensation in advance. If there's a difference between my fee and theirs, I'll let you know that too. And if they're not offering anything in advance, which by the way, most of the sellers won't eventually, it doesn't matter. We're just going to put it into the contract. We're going to negotiate the terms. Mm -hmm. That is it, man. This is where this whole thing is going to end up from this conversation. And it's yeah. already happening. So, yeah. And then in the event that the seller just fat out won't pay a commission, I mean, I know what I would do. But I know what my answer is, but, but I can give what it do you, you? Here's What's the script. That? Here's the script. Mr. and Mrs. Seller, you have benefited from one of the greatest asset classes in the United States, which is owning real estate. And in the past 10 years, your property price is likely double, right? Okay. Um, the cost to buy a house are expensive. Closing costs, insurance, all of these things. It is very likely that a majority of buyers who are going to write an offer on your home are going to request some type of help to pay for their for their representation. That doesn't mean you have to. It's totally your choice. My job is to prepare you for it. And if they can't afford to pay their agent, then they can't afford to buy your house. Mm -hmm. Now, there's ways we can do this, to be clear. So you need to remember, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, that let's pretend you put your house on the market and somebody came in with an all-cash offer at asking and is willing to pay their buyer's agent's compensation. Is that a good deal? The seller mm -hmm. says yes. What if we had a second offer that came in $75,000 over asking, but they're asking you to pay the buyer's agent's compensation, but you netted $50,000 more. Is that a better deal? Yeah. So you're open to paying compensation in that scenario. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's an education thing, right? We have, to, we have to educate the seller that it's not about whether you're paying compensation or not. It's about the net. We mm -hmm. got to get really good at doing net sheets again and, and talking about these scenarios with them so they can understand how this, how this works. And so that's the conversation that needs to be happening with, with the seller, explaining to them that compensation is part of it, but I'll also give you some stats. So I've been tracking this stuff for 45 days. 98% of the time, the seller pays the fee because they also want to do what? Sell the, sell the house. <laughs> like They want to sell the house. Two other comments as part of the scripting everybody should use. So unrepresented uh, buyers create a significant risk for your E&O policy. Uh, un unrepresented buyers and dual agency increases the, the risk of litigation by 17 to 22% because the buyer doesn't understand what they're signing. They don't understand the, the paperwork. They don't understand what their position is. The somebody feels harmed in dual agency contracts a lot of times. And so the insurance costs are going to skyrocket. So here's mm -hmm. another thing that's coming, by the way. Well, insurance costs are going to skyrocket. What was that? Higher e and and that'll get trickled down to the agents. A hundred percent. And then yeah. what will also happen is insurance companies are going to go, yeah, we ain't doing this anymore. So if you're doing dual agency, when I refer dual agency, single agent, dual agency, uh -huh. uh, they're going to go, nah, we won't even provide insurance to you. I give it 12 to 24 months before brokerages are faced with the fact they can't do dual agency or their, their insurance provider will not provide an E&O policy. And then, and then that, and then that, and then that scenario, you basically represent the seller and then the buyers unrepresented. Or you refer them to someone else and then uh -huh. they're represented by somebody, which to be clear, I have no problem with designated agency, two agents in the same brokerage. I just have a problem with the same agent representing both sides, right. um, but refer it out, which is what they should be doing anyway, because it lowers the risk. So, mm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's mm. the whole problem that's, that's coming with it. Um, here's the fun ones. You ready? This is one that no one's talking about yet. Uh, buyers signing multiple buyer rep agreements mm -hmm. happening everywhere. They don't know what they're signing. They don't understand the terms. Mm. The terms are unfavorable to consumers in many cases. You know, six month exclusive agreement, and the agent doesn't ever follow up with them, and they're in they're in contract with the they, agent. They show they showed them like one house and never talked to them again, or something like that. Happening all over the place. Mm. By the way, who's actually verifying that a buyer rep agreement was signed? Aren't title companies? Aren't some title companies in some areas? A doing few, that? most aren't. Yeah, they haven't yeah, figured out what to do with it. Here, they're asking for it around here. And again, now my, my, I've been hearing them starting to do this, but then I'm hearing them going, "I'm not giving you that." It's like, this, "How dare you ask for that?" It's like, "Well, how are we supposed <laughs> to verify there was an agreement signed?" Right. So, multiple right. buyer rep agreements, 
unfavorable mm-hmm. terms to the consumer that are very favorable towards the agent. There's no way out. You can't get out of the contract, like all of those things. Mm-hmm. Uh, the big one is uh, the title company, to your point, is not asking for a copy of it. How are they supposed to verify whether the agent was paid the fee they agreed to or more? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right, right. I mean, because right. Well, yeah, that's yeah. So, so who's regulating that? Like, I guess there'll be an audit from the state commissions of the contracts and buyer agencies. I mean, that's going to be a mess. It's MLS. MLS is enforcement. It's not state. Okay. So, because remember, the MLS is the enforcer of this. It's not the state, which is why yeah, you'll hear me. I've never even hurt. Like my MLS has never even audited anyone i don't i don't i can't i don't know a single agent that my local mls has audited like to see if they had a listing agreement that wasn't expired or uh-huh. you know well because remember in this particular case the auditing factor for the settlement is is the multiple listing service so the mls technically should be requesting a copy of the buyer rep agreement for every client that you have and they should require a copy of the buyer rep agreement before a property show i mean there's it's just this is a mess so so they could do so they could have in showing time or whatever they could have it to where you could upload it as you set up to show a property i mean that could be an easy fix yeah so so uh crmls through um re core their their entity just announced that they're they're launching a program to do this so that it's not just the auditing but there's benefits to it like the ability to cross um So like, you know, reverse prospecting. So here's buyers Mm -hmm. looking for this type of home. They're going to use a database to tell you, which I love, by the way, they're doing a database that you can go, okay, here's, here's, uh, here's this database of buyers working with these agents, their email and phone number. Mm -hmm. You don't see it, but you can attach it to your CRM system. So that as leads come in, it'll look at it and go, oh, that's not actually a lead. That's a buyer working with Ricky. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh Mm -hmm. shit, I'm not paying for that lead anymore. Like they've got some cool stuff they're doing there. But initial feedback is everyone's like, I don't want you seeing my buyer rep agreement. I'm going. It's going to end up that way. Someone's going to look at it because we got to enforce why these you, policies. Why wouldn't you want someone to see your buyer rep agreement? I don't know. Agents are, you know, agents are agents. They don't want people looking at stuff. Weird to me, so, but yeah, but like that, but that, that is interesting <laughs> that, and that's it. And the MLS you're saying? RE Core is a product. It's a company from CRMLS, largest MLS in the country. They have a separate development company that's going to make this module available for MLSs. Yeah. What's interesting is like, a thought I just had is like, okay, you get a listing agreement with the seller, it's in MLS and everybody knows like, you can't call that seller. You can't reach out to that seller. That seller is that agent, you know, yeah. they're, they're, they're together. They're representing them. You can't talk to them. It, it, it almost sounds like with this going on that it could uh, almost should be the same way with the buyers. Like that's my point in there. And like, you can't talk to that buyer. They are under contract. Right. For, for and then go, go deeper go deeper so imagine i think you do this anyway if i remember correctly like you're a big lead gen guy right so you've got a bunch of leads coming in so imagine you're paying a fortune for leads and imagine if you had ability to access a database where every lead that came in hit that database of buyers and Mm -hmm. agents working with those buyers and it could disseminate it could go 80 percent of the leads you just received are actual buyers working with another agent and only 20 percent of those are actually viable would you spend as much money on your lead sources if you had that information Right. No way. You cut down right. on your lead spend and they wouldn't be able to justify it. Like you want to talk about screwing up the lead gen business. What what CRMLS yeah. is doing is really smart. Um, mm-hmm. But my point behind all of this, there's so many problems here and I'll give you the worst of it. So what happens if you don't have a buyer rep agreement signed and it's an MLS enforcement? You know, MLS could right. shut down your account potentially. Um, what if it's like a fines? There could be fines, but to be clear, no one's doing this. What if you had a, is it a code of ethics violation that you're doing something? Well, so people are like, oh, code of ethics violation. So I'm no longer a realtor. What do you do? Here's the big one. You ready? Uh, licensed real estate agents that aren't a member of NAR who are not covered in the settlement don't have to follow those terms of the settlement. Meaning you have a license, but you're not a realtor. You have to follow the terms of the MLS, which is the enforcer of it. But for example... If why wouldn't we have the rules being applied to everyone with a real estate license, not just realtors? Mm. So in California, AB 2992 was just passed to make it so that buyer rep agreements before you show a home was enforced not only just for realtor members and people of the MLS, but every single licensed real estate agent. So the rules will cover everyone with a license, not just 
people that are part of that. That's in California. They just passed mm -hmm. that. But this is an example of things that need to be thought through because you've realtor members are required to follow the settlement terms. Mm -hmm. If you're not, you don't. Yeah. So that's interesting because <clears throat> some, some MLSs make it man. You're like, you have to be a member of NAR, the national association of realtors to be part of the MLS, but some MLSs don't. Correct. So the one, so some of them that don't, you could essentially be a member of the local MLS, but not a member of NAR. And then essentially, but th does that not trickle down because you're a member of the MLS, because uh, the member of the local board and MLS that that trickles down to you? There's, there's the rub. Away? There's the rub, right? So if I'm a member of the, this is the funny part. So it's an, a non-governed MLS doesn't have to follow the rules of NER settlement, but mm. I'm a realtor member. Mm. I have to follow the terms of the settlement, but everybody mm. else who isn't a realtor member in a non-NER governed MLS doesn't have mm. to follow any of the terms of the settlement, right? It's confusing. I know, isn't it? Like it's yeah. it's it's when you go down the rabbit hole of just the craziness that's happening. I'm I'm going, man, we hadn't thought this through at all. Um, so those are just like some of the things that I that I see out there that we've got to get through. Um, I'll add some positives. Really good agents are charging more. I was I, that that was going to be one of my questions. I mean, what? Yeah. what do you I've been saying that for a year. And and what are they? Are they charging more on the buyer side or the seller yeah. side? Yeah, they're charging more on the buyer side. They're going, look, I don't. That because it's no longer a, it's You're a separation it the seller the seller's paying it or i mean buy. i'm hearing that mm -hmm. i'm hearing that obviously hearing if a too. seller wants to sell their house i don't think you'll be able to pull that off in a you know in a seller's market i think that's going to be harder to do but mm -hmm. um where you got 15 offers that the comp the compensation is going to be a factor in that agents are gonna have to deal with that at some point but which is coming but right now I've seen agents who are charging more. They're going, you know, the, the the average number that they were charging before or receiving, I should say, before from the listing agent was lower than what they charge now and the buyers agreeing to pay it. Now, does it mean that they don't lower it down to make the deal come together? I'm assuming they do and that's a good practice. Agree on something higher, bring it down if you need to, but good agents are charging more and I'll go the opposite. Mediocre agents and and, and agents that are you know newer are charging less. Yeah, so they're, you're going to see a clear delineation between producers and part-timers in the in the business um but i have been saying that for a year i go if if it's decoupled and the seller the seller's agent isn't being responsible for your compensation anymore you can curate an entire experience for the buyer that's better and different in fact i'm all my keynotes i'm doing around the country i'm telling people you should have different levels of service maybe everything is this is my baseline but maybe you go into the ritz carlton experience where you pay for the packers and the movers and you like you build it into a higher rate but you curate the entire experience for that client that wants to pay more to have everything done for them i know people yeah. that would do that um so lots of opportunity man huge opportunity out there outside of the confusion and the um you know the small nuances between <laughs> all the the weird stuff with agents not um See, the problem before was that agents weren't <clears throat> educating clients on what their options really were. That's kind of what brought this along, right? Correct. And so we didn't fix that issue of helping, of educating agents to educate their clients. And so now it sounds like we're still in the same boat with agents not educating their clients on these buyer agency agreements. They're just throwing it down there. They're signing them just like they were before. Yeah. And now we're kind of in the same boat, it seems. Yeah. There's a lack of education going on in the industry. There's a, there's some, there's some great leaders who've done a fantastic job. You know, my friend Leo, the CEO of EXP, Sharon, the CEO of, of Real, they've done amazing work of educating their people on this process and, and also taking some, some shots. Like, you know, when Leo came out and said, we're not doing cooperative compensation, he took some arrows, but he made the right call and he actually led the industry in that process. And, you know, we're, we don't do it either. So like we were all kind of in the same camp and it's that you can tell the difference between agents that work for companies where the leadership has been at the forefront of this and really moving people in the right direction. And then leadership that's trying to hold on to the past. Yeah. You know, it's, it's the conversations are not difficult. This is really fundamentally, it's two specific conversations. The buyer's agent sits down, they do a consult, they talk about what they do, what they provide, articulate that value. What are you looking for? Let's talk about the market. Get good at your craft. If you can't mm -hmm. do that, get out. Like, just get good at it. Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, here's the other thing. You're going to see some agents that are going to offer compensation in advance. Some will not. I'll ask. It doesn't matter. 
everything is going to get put into the contract. It becomes a negotiation. So you find the house. I'll work with you. We'll figure out how to get you into that house as best as possible. That's the only conversation that's happening. I've seen so many damn agents out there going, well, I'm not going to show your house unless it's like, okay, first of all, that's steering. That is a mm. fiduciary violation and classified by the Department of Justice as illegal. So yeah. stop that shit. Like you need to understand what your job is. On the sell side, you can't say this. You can't go, if you don't offer cooperative compensation, no one's going to show your house. Wrong. Mm -hmm. That's not how it works. What you need to state is, we're going to approach this strategy of telling the buyer that we're willing to entertain any and all requests. Just put it in your offer. Mm -hmm. Mr. and Mrs. Buyer agent that calls and are like, why aren't you offering compensation? Because I have a fiduciary to my seller. And because all these rates are negotiable now between agents, you just need to put what you need inside the offer. Mm -hmm. I love this scripting, by the way, Ricky. I had a friend of mine who did this. You'll, you'll actually find this funny. Um, person called and asked, like, you know, what's your seller offering? He goes, well, we're, we're not offering anything in advance of an offer. And he goes, well, why not? He goes, well, because he goes, he goes, well, how about this? Tell you what, you send me your buyer rep agreement that you signed with your buyer. And then I'll talk about what the seller is going to pay for, for compensation. And he goes, I'm not sending you that. I have a fiduciary to the buyer. And he goes, exactly. Now that we established fiduciary, how about uh -huh. you put your request in the offer? And I was like, oh, right, damn, that right. was a good one. You know? Yeah. So it's just, everyone needs to get comfortable with this. And I'll, I'll make the craziest statement possible, but I will be right. And it's just a matter of time. Their long-term, where we're headed, to be clear, down the line is going to take a bit, okay? Your listing agreement is your fee. And it's the terms that you're going to do for the seller. And there isn't anything in that agreement at all. There's no concessions or the seller direct payment to buyer brokerage or no compensation. There just doesn't even need to be a conversation about compensation in it at all. It's mm -hmm. just listing agreement, my services to you, buyer agreement, my services to you, and everything just goes into an offer and a negotiation. For example, when you buy a car, does the seller tell you what they're willing to go down to? Right. No. You they put a price out and you go and like, okay, I don't think it's worth that. This is my offer. And then you negotiate and then you come up with a number and you sell it. It's an asset. We do it with everything else except real estate. So long term, to be clear, if everybody's listening, years down the line, all these listing agreements won't have any of this in there. It's just my fee for my services, buyer agent fee for their services, contract in the middle is what puts everything, everything goes into. So yeah, but so right now, 98%, you said of sellers are still paying they're agreeing to pay the buyer agent commission. And I think they will continue to because what you're trying to do here is get a deal done. I'll add another layer on that. <laughs> so this is the thing that lawyers didn't get right. 78% um, of sellers are buyers. Mm. So in the cooperative compensation world where you're paying the buyer's agent's fee, which still is happening most of the time anyway, when you go and buy your house, your next house, the seller's paying your buyer's agent's fees. So see what I'm saying? The money kind of went around. Yeah. Yep. All we're doing is removing that piece. So in the case of if it stays the same, it's almost the same anyway. If the sellers continue to pay it, it's their choice to do so. And certainly the rate will, will vary some. We're seeing that. But on the next property they buy, the same thing would apply. The seller will still likely pay that fee. So it's still, the money's just moving around in a circle. It hasn't necessarily it's, changed anything. It's something the sellers and the plaintiffs didn't really think through that uh, part, right? Because uh, like, <laughs> I remember the, uh, <clears throat> the lady got on the stand and she said that she, um, she had bought and sold. Let's see. She, she sold, she see, she sold, um, like three houses and bought five houses or something like that. Uh, she bought more than she sold. Uh -huh. And it was like, okay, so, so you, you got those five you benefited houses, from that, right? You got all the, all that representation on five homes, yeah. right? For, for, yeah. and you didn't pay out of pocket. It was figured into the, to the price and you, you paid the five or 6% or whatever you paid on the four homes. You're ahead. Number one. And, and then she went on to say that she's getting up in age. Her, her kids are starting to get older and that, and they're getting closer and closer to that first time home buying age. And if there's just anything she can do for her kids, she's going to do it by God. And I, I was thinking, lady, don't you realize that them being first time home buyers, they, they don't, you're, you're literally putting them in a position where they have to come out of pocket on top of, or like try to negotiate it into the price and put more friction on the entire home buying process. It was the funniest thing I've ever heard. I don't think people understand that this was a shakedown more than anything. Look, I'm, look, I want to make another Absolutely. statement though, just for clarity. 
I actually think I'm not I'm trying trying to upset people here. This system and where we're moving to is better. And it is for the following reason. I like this better. I do because here's the deal. Like you you can't this is the argument that I've always agreed with with the lawyers. And don't everybody shoot me on this. It, it, the, it's it's this simple. So good agents right now are curating a different experience. They're sitting down with a buyer and they're articulating value and they're garnering a higher comp rate. In the previous model, the seller's agent dictated what you got paid. Mm. So buyer's agents are going to benefit from this. And and so go the other way with it. A brand new licensee who just got their real estate license, why in the hell should they be paid the same amount as somebody who's been doing this for 20 years? Mm. Uh, because they're bringing the buyer... Not nah, stop. It's about representation. So yep. in this new model, the buyer gets to choose the type of representation they want. They will pay what they think the buyer representation is worth. And I can tell you from the numbers I've seen, compensation or the the amount of money the seller is saving overall is somewhere between 25 to 50 basis points because agents are they're negotiating with them. And so in this new model, the seller does benefit more. It it does. And I'm not I'm not so, suggesting that it's not has some issues, but it they are benefiting from this change, and buyers are also benefiting because they have a lot more room to play with what they want and what they're willing to pay. So how can the how can the how can the buyer agent <clears throat> win in this scenario, but also the sellers paying fifty basis points lower? How are both of them winning? They're not the buyer's agent that's not good at articulating value is going to be paid less. So you're talking averages then. So there'll be some deals where people are getting paid more, but average wise, sellers are paying twenty five to fifty. Paying, they're paying less they're paying slightly on less average basis, but then there are certain deals where they're actually paying more based it, on it, the. It, on I can the tell agent. you that I can tell you I'm not going to use numbers out of specifics because I don't want to deal with any antitrust issues. But on some of the numbers I looked at, we are seeing sellers pay a higher amount. Could have been the terms of the contract. There's a lot of reasons why it's in there, but I have not seen, I've seen numbers vary all over the place now. And if you average some of those out, it saves them money. I'll give you, I'll give you some examples. Um, I have this one company. There's more, I was there's more inexperienced agents than experienced agents. Yeah. But, but also, but also on this one company I was looking at, um, they had seven deals. They did seven listings. And um, in two of those deals, the buyer paid the buyer agent. Yeah. Yeah. Think about how much money that would have messed the seller up if you'd put that in advance of an offer. Mm -hmm. Right. They, that, that's what I was saying. Like if, if the buyer is willing to pay the buyer agent and then they walk into a situation of a home they love and they're offering two or 3% or whatever, they're like free money. That's like, the point. <laughs> that you did you, not have to give me, but thank you. You just screwed the seller. Yeah. Everything yeah. needs to be put into an offer mm -hmm. and then it's negotiated from there. I would, you know, depending upon the market, obviously, but I would set a date. All offers are received by this point in time. Everything comes in. We sit down, we look at all and we counter all of them. We counter one of them. We accept one of them. It's just a normal process. But I can tell you this system is better. We have a lot of work to get there. There's a lot of training for the agents to do to get there. And why I like it, and I, I'm not, I, again, I'm going to offend some people, but the good agents, the people that are here, the ones that are that are doing this, that are you know that really love their job and are and are trying to make this a career, are going to excel. And the ones that are dabbling, um, it doesn't mean they won't do business. They're just their compensation rate will come down. And in those particular scenarios, the seller might benefit from that, and or the buyer might get hurt by that because they have bad representation. All of this is going to be sort of a free market figuring itself out process. I think you'll see consolidation, which is good. I think you'll see less agents, which is good. Uh, and I think you're going to find that really good agents will will absolutely excel at this. And by the way, Americans as a whole, we love to pay for service and convenience. We're willing to pay for service and convenience. If you can articulate value clearly mm -hmm. and that's that the buyer goes, yeah, I want to have the best because this is an infrequent transaction I'm going to do a few times in my life. Mm -hmm. They're going to pay a premium for it. They will absolutely do it because that's how we operate in this country. Yeah. So, and all they have to do is go try to do a deal on their own once. It is a it is a very complicated transaction. And the lawyers have done a fantastic job of demonizing our industry. Mm. Uh, and we need to get better. 
we need to get way better at articulating value. So, you know, I'm involved in this, this company called Raise that's, that's all about articulating value. And I did this study with the Wave Group earlier this year. So we, we surveyed a whole bunch of, of home buyers on a lot of questions. And one of the questions we asked them was, how much time do you think an agent helps them um, buy a house? So 46% of those surveyed think agents spend less than 15 hours helping them buy a house. Mm -hmm. The actual number, the average amount of time that an agent spends helping somebody buy a house is 87 hours. So we have a serious problem between you know perception and reality, um, which is what that whole thing's about. But the point is, is that we have to get so much better at articulating value and people will pay you a premium for what, what they believe is value. We just have a public perception problem and we got to fix that as an industry. We got to get really good at explaining the complexities of it, the work that's involved, the average 145 things I'm going to do over the course of, you know, 57 days. All of these things are important that we just suck at and we got to get really much, much better at it. So, so the 87 hours, is that, is that just an average across buyers? It's an average. Sellers? Yeah, it's, it's actually just buyers. So the average realtor will spend between 80 to 100 hours helping somebody buy a house. Um, it's kind of right, right around the number. Um, they'll do around 125 activities with about 200 outcomes. Um, and currently we're looking at around 57 days worth of work. So it's, it's so amazing when you look at what agents actually do versus what the consumer thinks we do. Yeah. Um, and as soon as you expose all of that and you show them all the work that you're doing, they go, holy shit, I had no idea my agent was doing all of that. You know, the other funny part is when the agent sees all the work they do too, they're like, I didn't realize I was doing all that work either. <laughs> doing all that. I had no idea. You know? you know, so, that's why it's so hard for them to articulate because a lot of this stuff know. is second, second nature and we're just kind of doing it. We take it for granted. Um, you know, it's really grueling, gritty work, but we're just so used to it. It's just part of our life. Well, just, just think about this, Ricky. You, 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 your client calls said, I want to see this house. Okay, great. Uh, you set up a showing, maybe you call the listing agent in advance, try to get any information. You drive to the showing, right? So there's 15, 20 minutes. You're at the showing. There's another half an hour. You spend another 15 minutes in the driveway talking about the property. Mm -hmm. Like, I really yeah. like it. Okay. You go back, get a copy of the disclosure. Someone's got to read it. Mm -hmm. Who's reading it? The agent. Yeah. You're going to go through the disclosure. You're going to boil that down in an email, type the email out, send it to the buyer, wash, rinse, repeat, do that six to 10 times. And you're already 30 to 40 hours in. Yeah. Now those little 15 minute calls in the driveway you know, that turn into 30, 40 minutes, right? Just jabbering like, yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that it happens. is so, right. is so, is literally what Ray's, this company is doing is exposing all of that. It's incredible what it's created. But when you expose that to the agent and you expose that to the client and create this collaborative experience, the whole world changes. The buyer goes, I, Jesus, my agent's a rock star. And you're like, yeah, I am. And, I, and then you're then you're thinking in the back of your brain, like, I'm spending a lot of time with this guy. I can actually buy a house. Like at some point, I need to fire him because I can't keep spending this right. much time. So, so how do so how do we as an industry change that public perception? Of well, it? I mean, the first thing, I mean, look, I not to publicize, but I think everybody should go check out what's actually being rolled out across the country at, at Rays. I think it's incredible. You'll you'll see all are? about it. Yeah, so just go to raise.com, R A Y S E.com. Um, the product actually launched a month ago, and over 300 real estate companies onboarded in the first 30 days what was insane. What is the product? What is the product? It's literally that. So it's an app that tracks everything the agent does in an automated fashion, and then it provides an app to the buyer. And then there's a, it's a collaborative experience. So it lays out all the things the agent's going to do. And as they're making those phone calls, and it's logging all that time, and it's logging that travel and that mileage, and all of that, it exposes it to the buyer. So they're seeing this entire journey walking out. And every week it's cumulative. It's going, my agents now spent 25 hours working with me and it changes the whole concept. So presentation up front about what you do, collaborative experience. In the end, it creates a closing report. It's the best part of it. It's like, here's the 197 things I did over the course of 56 days. There's 21 pages worth of work that's done, the amount of time that I spent. And the buyer's like, wow, like, thank you so much. And the agent goes, you're welcome. And this is why I get paid. This is my fee is how it breaks it down. It completely shifts the whole thing. Every single aspect of what we are facing is, is solved in the product. So, so the buyer creates an account or whatever. Yeah. It's linked up to the agent. Yeah. yeah linked up to the agent. Mm -hmm. And then, and mm -hmm. then there's an app. And so you basically log everything. You just go in there and just click. It's actually, it, 
it, it right now, 40% of it's automated. It'll be about 70% automated, meaning the agent doesn't have to do much of anything with it. It's just working behind the scenes through technology. It's just tracking you and it's doing all this stuff. It's, it's incredible. And by the end of the year, it'll be 90%. So the agent will maybe interface with it a minute a day. It's incredible. Yeah, it's really incredible. It's been a two-year project. So yeah. That's amazing. Anyways, I wasn't here to pitch that, but that is no, how you no, answer. Absolutely. No, yeah. that's fine. Um, so, so in the future, because right now, um, you're telling me the data is 75% of agents are still offering the buyer agent commission through either concessions mm -hmm. or through, uh, you know, through the actual, how we used to do it, et cetera. Yeah. Okay. But, but eventually we're going to get to where that's almost non-existent. It will eventually, go away. Eventually long-term, right? Um, I think that, I think cooperative compensation is going to go away within the next six months. Yeah. Cause you can't right. be competitive. Like, I don't know how you compete with somebody who's not offering it. If you're going to compete on listings, you'll lose every time. So that process and the, and the cost of litigation is going to drive that in the forms of offering even concessions or a seller direct payment to the buyer brokerage. I think all of that goes away over the course of years out of the forms. Mm. So, yeah. What I was getting at was that at that time in the far dist in the far future when when we we do get that eliminated to a certain point where there's not even a whole lot of concessions being offered or however it turns into where we can offer it mm -hmm. at that point right now 98 percent of sellers are still paying it through either the offer or mm -hmm. you know, offering up front so you know, and when we go in and like when next time agents go and they talk to sellers and like, hey, you know, we don't do that. This is the way we do it. We're going to wait for the offer to come in because this is what, you know, this is the way that it needs to be done. Because why would we say we're going to pay this when X, et cetera, et cetera. Are we still having those conversations? Do you still feel like sellers are going to 98 percent of sellers will be paying it at that future time when uh, we get to that point and and when we're going in and having these conversations are we explaining to them hey we're not going to offer it up front chances are chances are they're going to put something in the offer not every time but but be ready for it to kind of yep. set the expectations etc yep. like that's going to be the new world is more setting yep. the expectations we don't know what it's going to be we don't know if they're going to offer anything but there's a good chance they're going to offer something just so they're not shocked when they see that there's yeah. a ten thousand dollar fee yeah. And also that like buyers are strapped. The real estate in this country is completely out of control expense wise. I mean, it's just, it's very expensive. People are having to save up every dime to be able to buy a house. So expect those to be in the offer. You can choose to do it or not. That is your choice. But if the buyer can't afford to pay their agent representation fee, then it's going to become a term that makes the deal not come together. And so you will have to choose on whether you want to or not. And I think you go further. The system has been this way for a long time because of this exact situation. It's now changed. It's always been the fact you didn't have to, but we're gonna we're changing the process now more so so that you can see everything laid out and then we can make those choices. Again, 78% of the time, the seller is gonna buy a house. So what goes around comes around. You should consider that. But it is completely up to you. My job is to represent you. You can choose what you want to do. Sure. Again, it's all about terms of the contract and what your initial goal is. You got to remember, this is part of the reason why I think these people need to, I've said this a million times to, to the lawyers. The housing market is the worst since 1995. Yeah. Like it was going to be a worse year than last year. Yeah. Um, people are selling houses because they have to. Mm -hmm. It's because of, family, divorce, job relocation, like it's, there's, there's reasons. So they're not going to make 30 to 40% equity in a property and let a smaller number in there, stop them from selling their house. They have life to live. Mm -hmm. Sellers want to sell the house. They're not doing this for their health. I mean, maybe they are, but points the same. So like, I don't, I don't think I don't think this becomes a thing where if it's like, well, I have to pay compensation. I'm not selling my house. Okay. Then maybe there's a buyer that comes across that has that, but the potential for a majority of buyers in this country to be able to cover their agent's fee. Mm -hmm. Good luck. We yeah. all know that. So I think that the model shift is going to end up being good. I think it will save the seller some money. There's certainly a lot more flexibility in things, and it's going to drive out agents that aren't good at their job. And I do think long term, we've got a lot of, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of crap to get through. I think long term, the industry will be stronger. I think there'll be a lot more transparency. 
I think they'll actually love what we do more, especially with what I just mentioned, what we're working on to like drive the value of a realtor front and center. Um, and I think a majority of the time seller is going to pay the fee because I know as an educated seller, which we'll educate them on, I don't want an unrepresented buyer. That's just asking for problems. I don't want to do dual agency because it's just asking for problems. And so if I've got a good offer and I need to pay some compensation on the other side to make it come together. Okay. One last comment. Everyone has to remember the psychology of this for sellers. The equity in their house is basically found money. Meaning they're not, it's not like, the $500,000 worth of equity is sitting in their bank account as cash that they've been spending on shit for the past 20 years or 10 years or five years. So when they sell the property, they see it as a cash infusion. All of a sudden, I now have this money. So the ability to pay some of that out to close the deal psychologically is just part of that process. Mm -hmm. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? What about the like, okay, let's say, a, let's say a seller buys a house today, right? And the next year, prices are up 4% which is what some analysts said I saw the other day, you know, and so that little 4% increase covers the seller's commission and some closing costs or whatever the seller's agent listing agents commission and some closing costs. Mm -hmm. Right. But like literally what if they owe, right? Let's say they owe just enough to sell it, pay the listing agent and a little bit of closing costs. Right. There's, they can't even, there's no equity. They literally bought it six months ago and they're, they're doing great to get, are they, today, uh, right? Those sellers are just waiting on a buyer that doesn't ask for the buyer agent fee to be paid. Right. That's but, but that, that's no different than what it's been. Right. I mean, yeah. like, that's, right. that's it not anything be, new. It would have been, you know, five or six. And so it still would have ate into that side of it. So the new model actually works better in their favor then. Yes. It works better because they actually get on the market versus saying there's no, no use. I can't afford to pay the buyer agent. So at yeah. least they have a chance. And it also becomes yeah. a negotiation. Like I'm not to be clear. And I know everyone's thinking like now, well, James, you're missing the fact that buyers can't pay the fee. And what if I'm in a competitive offer situation and you know, that, that somebody comes in with an all cash offer and doesn't have caught, you know, the agent doesn't have to be paid by the seller. They're going to win. I'm like, yeah, 2021 with when they, when they were the waiving uh, inspections and they were yeah. doing a hundred thousand yeah. over, I mean, it's really the same thing. It's the same thing. So do you think, so back in like 2000, I can't mm -hmm. remember when it was, but after that exodus happened with mortgage in the mortgage industry, I remember there was like, from the numbers I heard from mortgage people, they said that at one point there was like 450,000 mortgage, um, you know, LOs. people, in, uh, LOs in, mm -hmm. in, in the country. And then went down to like 150,000 or something like that due to the, you know, the government regulations and stuff like that. What, what kind of exodus do you really think you'll see number wise like there's about two million agents right when you count non 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 members. Non realtor members yeah. yeah it's more than that actually um like in california they're just shy of two hundred thousand realtors and i think licensees is close to four hundred thousand um uh i do a million in the country yeah i forget Licensed. the number is somewhere between two and two and a half but the points yeah. doesn't really matter the point's the same i think you're gonna see um, my number, I have number I've been using previously is 20 to 40%. I brought that down now to, I think somewhere between 20 to 30%, um, because the impacts of this are not as, I don't think they're going to be as big as everybody thought it would be. Um, I think you're going to see attrition simply because margins are going to get squeezed on a, on a group of people out there. Um, but I don't think it's going to be as as significant as what I'd originally had been saying, and maybe forty percent. I'm down to thirty percent now, and if I'm guessing, it could be more towards twenty, somewhere between that number. But you're going to see an exodus of people for sure. It's too early though. You need to wait like yeah, another. Yeah. We're yeah. we're six months, to twelve months probably, out before we're going to have that number. Probably longer than that to get yeah. the year because people pay their dues for the year. Probably yeah. be 2026, this, January 2026. Is when yeah, I'd go with that. You'll have a much more, but then also keep in mind if the market picks back, there's market infect in this too. So the market's mm -hmm. been shit. And like, if we have another bad year, you'll see more exodus. But if the market picks up, people might leave, but more people come in. You, you have some people like, oh, real estate's really good to be in. They don't know any different. They did. It's by the way, a really cool comment somebody made me the other day. They're like, remember everybody coming into the industry post August 17th has had no perspective on the past. They, they don't know. They don't know what it was. They just, they just know right? what it is this, today. This is the only thing they know. It's almost like being born into yeah. something. It's all yeah. you know. 
Yeah. So um, people will come back in the industry if the market picks back up and we will have mm -hmm. another run up. Like I think 2025 mm -hmm. forward is another two, three, four year run up because we've got a lot of pent up demand, not enough housing rates will come down, blah, blah, blah. Um, that will, that will stop some of this attrition because if an agent does an extra deal that they hadn't done before, they have more money in yeah. their pocket to stay in the business. I'll pay another year worth of fees. What about what about NAR and their membership and their situation? NAR's got some problems. Um, and for everybody listening, I am a supporter of NAR, to be clear. Uh, I want to just preface this before I make these comments. It is the most important trade association that you're all a member of. I don't care about any of your opinions on all the crap that's happened because if NAR goes away and advocacy in Washington, D.C. goes away, good luck. Your 1099 well, you status Washington, DC has been trying to do to us. I mean, I, every time an agent says I hate any arm, like you're an idiot. You don't get it. Like Shannon McGann and the 65 people that work for her in DC are stopping bad bills from being passed all the time. Your 1099 status on the chopping block every year. Imagine if you had to be a W2 based employee to work at a brokerage. Now, I can now tell you exactly would crush. that way. Crush 70% of the agents would be unemployed the next day. No way. Mm -hmm. So like mm -hmm. every time I hear this, I'm just like, you do not get it. Grow up, go look at what they actually do. There's a lot of dumb shit. I get it. It's a lot of good shit. The good shit outweighs the bad shit. So like, you know, understand that your $56 is the best thing you could possibly pay on the planet for the amount of advocacy work that team does. Mm -hmm. That being prefaced, I think NAR has got a lot of problems. Um, they've got the three-way agreement, which is being contested. Um, association, or I shouldn't say associations. MLSs are trying to see how much governance they want. Um, you know, Nakia Wright, who I've spent a lot of time with, I think she's great. She's got a massive business background. Um, she has, doesn't have real estate experience. That's the, you know, the thing that people are bringing up saying they're concerned about it, but I've done both interviewed her on my podcast for an hour. I've done a one-on-one -on -one with her in Chicago for an hour. I've spent time with her. She's smart. She brings in the right people around her and the right leadership team around her. I think that she can turn the ship around. Um, and, you know, you just saw that start, you know, I think that there, she's making moves on the leadership team. Um, I don't have any idea what the backstory is, but we all know that Katie Johnson's out as the chief legal officer. So maybe there's more to come. Maybe there isn't. Uh, but NAR has got to make some moves. And I think you're going to see a lot of pressure on, on associations, unfortunately, because there's, there's going to be a lot of people contesting the three-way agreement that you have to be a, a you know realtor member in order yeah. to have access to the MLS. By the way, that's actually a, a local MLS policy decision, not actually people think it's NERs. It's not. Um, mm -hmm. But I think you're going to see a lot of push on associations. Associations are going to see a lot of consolidation. And I think mm -hmm. you're going to see membership drop, unfortunately, for, for all the wrong reasons. Um, they've got to learn. MLSs, local boards. Membership at MLSs is there. I think they're a little more insulated depending upon some of the things that we're going through. So MLSs are a necessity. Like you need to be a member of the MLS to like right. do your business. Um, I think they'll try to disassociate them. Talking about that, you will see some drop off there. I think you'll see membership drop off there just because people move the industry. But if you're going to sell real estate, uh -oh. you have to remember you got to uh -oh. you got to have access to the MLS to do believe, anything. Believe in the business. Yeah, like I mean, yeah, yeah, how yeah. would you do your business without the MLS? Um, right. The big issue for associations right now, NER, state and local, is articulating value. And they've not done a good job of that. And they've relied, unfortunately, on this three-way agreement. And they need to get better at it. Um, I've been pretty vocal about the fact that they've got to learn how to change their value proposition so people want to be part of the association. And MLSs, the biggest threat to MLSs right now is clear cooperation policy. I was just fixing to ask you about that. Yeah, that's the biggest... Um, the clear cooperation policy is under threat and it's, I mean, look, I'm not going to be shy about it. It's about greed and nothing else. Clear cooperation policy was designed to stop agents from holding inventory off market to try to get more buyers to inquire on the listings, yeah. to get more leads, to double end deals and make more money. It right. is extraordinarily harmful to sellers and it is absolutely harmful to buyers We've developed the greatest system in the world, which is called the MLS. Mm. It is absolutely, uh, you know, it's not that it doesn't have its issues, but it works better than anywhere else. Mm. And I remember, Ricky, and this is incredibly important for people to hear what I'm about to say, because I have a whole op-ed coming out on this on the newswires. I remember in 2012 through 2017, 
that there was 30% of the inventory in Silicon Valley, California, the Bay Area, was off market held by two companies. 30% was not on the MLS, was not on a portal, was being held internally to market so they could double end deals, increase profits, and benefit those organizations. And here's what they did. They would tell they would tell sellers, well, it's about privacy, and we don't have to have people walking through your house, and your house is exclusive, and I can double end the deal. I've got a potential buyer, and I'll lower my commission amount. And here's mm -hmm. what happened, because history will repeat itself. Sellers did it because the agent told them it was a good idea. Mm -hmm. Then they found out six months later, the same house that they had in the same neighborhood sold for $500,000 more when it was on MLS versus off. Then they yep. sued the agent in the brokerage for basically fraud uh, and it round and around it went and it is the brokerage companies that do this will recruit agents they'll say well you can't have access to this inventory because it's only available within this firm but if you worked here you could have access to that inventory so it's recruiting it's about recruiting mm -hmm. people it's about double ending deals it's about lead gen it's about profit and for some of the companies that are spearheading this is about stock price this is the most harmful practice possible to take properties off market for buyers and for sellers. And every MLS study I've seen shows that sellers will make between five to as high as 17% more when it is marketed around the globe versus being marketed internally in a company. The agenda is about profit. It's not about helping consumers. I'll caveat that. I'm a free market guy. I think sellers should have choice. I don't have a problem with that. As long as the seller is educated on the decision they're making, not steered by the agent or brokerage, but educated. Mm -hmm. Like these are the pros of being on the MLS. These are the pros of having this on the marketplace. You're what it's put on Zillow. It's put on homes. It's put on realtor. This mm -hmm. is the average amount of money that you will make more by putting on the MLS versus off. This is the price of your house. This is the difference on what you will likely lose if you are keeping it off market a very clear disclosure. If the seller wants to make the choice, then I'm okay with that as long as they're educated, but it ain't going to be educated by the brokerage or agent that's trying to do something that's all about money. Mm -hmm. That's the fundamental of CCP conversation right now. That's yep. the truth. So, you know, we're all going to decide how we want to handle this, but I hope the industry doesn't take the, take it backwards. Cause here's the thing. Everybody in this industry is scared of the 800 pound gorilla. Zillow homes, realtor, right? Imagine if all of a sudden those websites couldn't get inventory anymore because everybody was holding it off. Uh -huh. What do you think they're going to do if all of a sudden the industry is like screwing their business model? Pay you think play. they're just going to, yeah. Or you think they're just going to sit idly on the side? I mean, oh, everyone's man. been worried about Zillow becoming a big national brokerage. Mm -hmm. Imagine if all of a sudden they couldn't do their business model anymore, but they're still the biggest website in the world, still generating tons of leads. Imagine if they, I'm not, by the way, I'm just, totally hypothetical. I'm not saying this any conversation I've had, but don't put it past them to figure out how to become the biggest player in the real estate industry. Mm -hmm. You fit, you, you, you screw with companies of that size, there'll be repercussions. And I don't think the people that are talking about removing CCP understand the dynamics of what will actually occur here. So, yeah. Well, what they're talking about is, is, um, sellers having the choice, et cetera. What if they're going through a divorce? Have you, I, I'm sure you read the article that they, they put up. Yeah. Um, you know, um, what are they going through uh, divorce? They want to keep everything private or, you know, they, they named a couple of different scenarios. I mean, for me, it's like, just don't put it, just don't list it really give them, you know, and, and then, and, then, and, 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 and like, there's a lot of talk about like pocket listings, right? Mm -hmm. What is the actual rule at this point on quote unquote office listings? exclusives? It's called an office exclusive. It's the carve out in CCP, which basically means that you you can't advertise it publicly, but you can advertise it internally. Right. So is that an exclusive <clears throat> listing agreement that you get with? It's the exclusive, seller? but you can't you can't advertise it publicly at all, or then you get fined for violating CCP. If you're going to advertise it publicly and you're a member of the MLS, you have to cooperate and share like everybody else does. That's the right, purpose right, of right. it. So, so is it a listing agreement altogether? A different no, document? same listing agreement. It's just some sort of form saying you're not going to put it on the MLS. I mean, I don't know how the companies are doing this. So, but so, that's so, what the, so then what? Are, what are the what I'm the one I'm getting at is is the that's in place. So mm -hmm. why? Are, so 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 it's obvious that there's just a an agenda. They want the to do this. They want to be able to not put it on the MLS. Create a put it on their website publicly. 
Remember, office mm. exclusives, you can't advertise it publicly. It's just internal uh -huh. marketing. Uh huh. Publicly advertise it. Maybe even cut a deal with one of the big portals to get their traffic. Mm. And then all the business comes back to that company. Mm. So it's, it's to be clear, it's all about the company generating more revenue. That's all it's about. Uh -huh. So there's uh -huh. a bunch of ways they could do this. But what they don't want is it on every other real estate company website. They don't want it out there. So it's like, you got to work uh -huh. with me in order right. to get so office exclusives, you right. can't market it publicly. Get rid of CCP. You can choose where you want the listing to go and then market out there. Uh -huh. Again, it could be that I don't want to put it on Zillow. I'd argue you have a fiduciary responsibility to do so. Mm. It's the biggest website in the world. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I mean, they kind of act like more exposure isn't good. <laughs> Some of these guys <laughs> are like, they're like, if it, if, 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 if getting, if getting more exposure uh, is good, then why, why aren't every single, um, products being sold on Amazon? Cause that's the biggest portal. Um, it, it was so funny. I don't know if you read the article. I, um, I try to ignore them because none of them are based in logic. And the reality I is what they were saying though. It was, it was kind of comical. There the, was a the seller a, wants to sell their house for the highest price possible. 99% of the time, minus unless you're Taylor Swift, you want to get the house on the market and sell it for the highest price possible. The only way you do that is then. through massive exposure. Two questions then to, yeah. to, to finish the show. Yeah. What do you think the chances of clear cooperation um, going away? And, and what do you think the chances are in the next 10, 20, 30 years that agents go to a W-2? Oh, two good questions. I don't think clear cooperation will go away. I think it'll get modified. Um, because it's it's pro consumer and, and I, I happen to know the DOJ understands what it's about. And so I think office exclusives will go away. But I think you could see some type of seller opt out form. Why that's would office very, exclusives go away? Because it's all about your internal promotion and greed. Uh-huh. Meaning because remember, you can only market internally to your own company. Right, right. Not public. So that's all about greed. Right. <laughs> like, right, right. You can't that's you can't crazy. nobody knows about the property at all. That's all hundred percent greed. The end. Um, right. Uh, when you get rid of CCP, it's public, but you'd have to go imagine the buyer experience, by the way, with CCP going away, the buyer would have to go to 30 different brokerage websites to see what's actually for sale. Yeah, no, I, it's I, that's, horrible. What I, that's what I was worried about with these rules coming into effect is would that happen where everybody yeah. holding their own, there will all do it. If, if look, if compass does it, EXP is going to do it. If EXP is going to do it, Redfin's going to do it. So is Berkshire Hathaway. So is Baird and Warner. So is the die. Like go down the list. Everybody will do the same thing. We create the worst marketplace ever in the United States. And every single realtor at every single company will be harmed. And every single seller and every buyer will be harmed in the process. All out of greed. That's the domino effect. There's no scenario where like EXP is three times the size of compass. You don't think Leo is, would would create an office, a, a, an off, a whole system around it to benefit EXP if mm -hmm. Compass and everybody else did it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like was, I know Leo was, really well. They, act, they, they acted like in the article that EXP wouldn't benefit from, uh, like they're they're like they wouldn't benefit from EXP like, would getting, massively benefit from I, getting I, rid I, of CCP. It was so funny, I'm telling you, this article, the articles I've read about this are hilarious. Um. But so anyway. the last question you asked was W2. And the yeah. answer to that is I don't because um, Redfin has spent 15 years trying to figure out how to do a W2 based model and hundreds of millions of dollars. And they are moving away from it. Mm -hmm. So Redfin Next is all about recruiting traditional agents on a traditional split and letting them make as much money as possible. And they're moving away from it. They haven't been able to make it go. And, and Glenn Kelman is brilliant. I know him really well. He's a smart guy. I've interviewed him on my podcast. Like he's great. And he's if they haven't been able to figure out in 15 years, I don't see how it's going to work. Also, I think one thing you need to remember, you can't uh, be a, a W-2 based model would mean you're employing everybody. Um, it's You can't use this 1099 status just for clarity. So everybody would have to be W-2 in order to do this. And no one's been able to figure it out and margins are shrinking. So I just don't see it. I think it's going to continue in its current capacity with some slight variations in process. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. yeah, It's a great time, man. It's going to be fun. I'll, I'll leave you with this though. Um, so much opportunity out there if you're paying attention. If you're leading from the front and you are planning your business around where the puck's going to be and you're skating to that, you are going to make so much money and you're going to be consumer oriented. You're going to help your buyers and sellers. 
Like just start moving forward and let everybody else live in the past and you are going to excel. This is the greatest opportunity ever right now to take your business to the next level, especially where the market is and we're about to come up. Like just be thinking about where you need to be and you'll be at the top 10%. So that's it guys. You heard it right there. Thanks. There it is coming on, man. Appreciate you so much. You got it.